Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Jackie Jacob. I am the um, coordinator for the Small and Backyard Flocks Community of Practice on eExtension and as such organize our monthly webinars. And I thought it would be really interesting to finish off the year with um, actually cooking some of the different types of meats that we have been discussing throughout the year with our monthly webinars. Um, so we, that's why we went with a, a chef for um, our last uh, presentation. During the presentation, I will be on mute. Um, so if you don't see me, then there are no questions. If you have a question, just type it in either the chat box or the Q&A box. If the question is relevant to what um, the speaker is talking about at the time, then I will pop up, you'll see me pop up in my video and I will um, ask the question for clarification. Otherwise, we'll save the questions for the end. Um, and at any time you think of a question, just type it in. Otherwise, if you're like me, you tend to forget your question if you don't <laughs> put it down right away. So, um, so our speaker today is Bob Perry. He is the chef in residence here at the University of Kentucky. And uh, we've worked with him on uh, different poultry things in the past. And um, I'm glad that he could come and present today on creative cooking with poultry meat. So as I said, I will be on mute. Anytime you have a question, please just type it in the chat box or the q and I will be monitoring both. All yours, Bob. Hey. See this machine. I farm a couple of summers did, ago. Did you have sound with it? There is sound. Okay, we're not hearing it. So um, stop sharing and then reshare, but click the sound. There's a sound button when you click the share. I didn't realize you had sound. Whoops. So when you when you click share. Down in the bottom left hand, it says something about sound. I see it. Okay, make sure that's clicked. And then when you play, it will come up. Now we're. I was saying this was on our farm a couple of years ago. That's my son, Mac, in the background, letting the chickens out in the morning. This is one of the egg, egg mobiles we had on the farm that summer. Playing with the chickens and moving them around. But since we're just finished with Thanksgiving, let's begin by talking about turkey. It's the biggest bird we have around here anyway. And commodity turkeys and chickens are injected with a saltwater solution that seasons them and helps them keep moist. But it also adds to the profit of the producers as when you buy a commodity bird, you're paying the same price for the weight of the salt water they injected into it as you are for the meat. Now you can accomplish the same and even better results uh, by browning a backyard or free range bird yourself. A simple poultry brine is a gallon of water, a cup of salt, and a half a cup of sugar. And to this, you can add some flavor enhancers, uh, fresh herbs or dried herbs, peppercorns. Um, I like to put a little sorghum in mine. It, it finishes when you cook it, gives a little golden color. And whatever you're gonna infuse it with, you need to bring the brine to a boil and then let it cool down to room temperature before you add the poultry. You're, if you're gonna brine cut up pieces of birds, then they only need to be in the brine a couple of hours. For a whole chicken, it needs to be in there about eight hours. For a big turkey or something, at least 24 hours. And after you take it out of the brine, you should rinse it and then dry it and then put it on a rack in the refrigerator for pieces just a few hours. But if you're planning on smoking, then you should leave it in the refrigerator about 24 hours. And what happens is the, the skin will get very tacky 
And when you go to smoke, that really lets the smoke stick to the skin. It really makes it good. And a, there's also dry brining where the bird is heavily salted, allowed to rest overnight and then rinsed. And this is a method employed in making confit, which is an ancient French way of preserving poultry, especially duck and goose before refrigeration. And I use this method of uh, confit on my Thanksgiving turkey every year. And a couple of years ago, I did a video for the Herald Leader and I think we'll just watch that right now. And then we'll talk about doing the same process with some chicken. All right, so here's your all purpose, locally raised pastured turkey by our friend Todd Clark at Clark Family Farms in Fayette County. And really breaking down a turkey is no different than breaking down a chicken. All you wanna do is find out where the joints are, cut through the joints. There's the bones are a little tougher, it's a little bigger, but it's the same exact thing. part but you just have to take your time and follow the bone. So there you go there's the carcass, there's your double breast. You can see there's a void right here. See that void in there? So what I'm going to do is make a little cut here. Fold that out. Same thing over here. Just a little cut. Fold that out. The opportunity to give a little salt on the inside. This is Herb de Provence. This has little lavender flower buds in it. So this is just cotton butcher's twine. That's like it. It works just as easy if you have somebody hold it and then just tie individual loops around it. Just try and tie it together. Voila. Fayette County. Nice. Park 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 Park. So can you purchase this like at Good Foods? Mm, yep. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so this is the, the dark meat in the wings of the turkey that's been salted and in the fridge overnight. There's a couple of little plates down on the bottom of this and if you look in the corner you can see how much liquid the salt has drawn out. So basically the salt starts to cure the turkey, just like you would cure a ham or anything else. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna rinse this, rinse the excess salt and dry it, and then we're gonna proceed with the confit. Nice and dry. See the nice color of that? It's been salted, it's really pretty. That is if you like turkey. I think turkey's pretty. Olive oil for this. The classic French confit would of course be done with goose fat or duck fat. And if you're doing a chicken and olive oil is nice sometimes, but canola is very neutral in flavor. So this is gonna let you taste what the turkey tastes like. And this looks like a lot of oil, but it has a purpose. So that's a little less than two quarts in this pan gonna make sure that there's oil underneath, around, and all over. If we let this go a little longer, I could just take it and go like that, and the meat would just come right off. The 
try it like that. That's yep. pure. That's pure turkey. Mm -hmm. So you know what do you do with this oil? the oil? Do you throw it out? No, you can use it. So you. It's like it's been deep. So oh, it's also really easy to do this with a pastured chicken and results in fantastic and super tender leg quarters. Uh, so Bob, start... Can I, I just ask a couple of questions? Sure. Um, one, I saw that it said 160 degrees. Isn't it poultry 165? I think it is now. Back then it was 160. Okay, so 165 is what they should cook for. Right. And um, some of the... Um, Participants might not know what confit is, if you'd like to explain. Get to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so confit, and, and I will explain that in a little bit. We're going to go through this with the chicken a little slower. So I start with a whole chicken and break it down into eights, meaning legs, thighs, breasts, and wings. And I generally will use the breast elsewhere. The backbone, neck, and wings will go into a roasting pan with carrot, celery, onion, and then into a 400 degree oven for about 30 minutes just to get a little browning on them. And then uh, to be honest, I usually just eat the wings as a snack at that point because they're really delicious. Uh, and then I take the pan and deglaze it with a little white wine. And then everything gets dumped into a stock pot covered with water. Throw in some peppercorns, some herbs, especially marjoram. Marjoram has a real affinity for poultry. Um, we put all that in a stock pot, cover with water, bring to a boil, then turn it down just to a simmer and let it go for a couple of hours. And you're going to strain it. When you roast the carcass and the veggies first, it really deepens the flavor. For a less strong broth, uh, the bones and scraps can be boiled without roasting. You know, my granny would simply boil a whole chicken to make chicken and dumplings, and I still can't make it as good as she could. The stock or bone broth, as people like to call it these days, it's really the same thing, uh, is really liquid gold though. It can be drunk on its own, used as a soup base, or further reduced as a glaze for a sauce. And I'll talk about that a little bit more when we get to guinea hens. Legs and the thighs are heavily salted with kosher salt. Now chefs use kosher salt for a few reasons. One, because it's pure. If you look at table salt, table salt has iodine in it and we don't want that metallic taste. And we also like kosher salt a lot because you can pick it up with your fingers. Um, try and do that with table salt, it doesn't work very well. The kosher salt is really nice. And once the parks have been heavily salted, uh, put them in a container with something to keep them off the bottom, either a rack or in this photo, it was a little saucer set in the bottom, just like in the, in the turkey. It's overnight in the refrigerator. The next day, take it out, rinse and dry the pieces. See the liquid that came off of those pieces, just like in the turkey video. Next, you want to pour a little canola oil in the bottom of a dish, just big enough to hold the pieces. For a single chicken, a bread pan works really well. Um, I like to use canola oil in this because of the neutral flavor. I want to taste the chicken and not the oil. You could use really any oil. And traditionally, this was done with duck or goose fat from the birds that were being used. This is confit is what I was talking about. Once the waterfowl was cooked, it was packed into crocks. And then the fat that rendered off of it and it was cooked in was poured over the meat. And then the, the crock was moved to a cool room or a cellar where, of course, the fat would congeal. And that kept the meat for several months. So to use this confit, uh, you simply would reach in the crock and pull out a piece of usually a leg quarter and wipe the fat back into the crock. And then you would brown the meat in a dry pan. My chef in France did this. We, we had uh, duck confit in the restaurant all the time. And it was so nice just to reach in there, grab a, a leg quarter of a duck, wipe off the fat, put it right into a dry skillet. And of course, as soon as it got warm, the residual fat clinging to the meat would go to the pan and that would be used to brown the, brown the meat in. For our purposes, we've got the, the chicken legs and quarters in there. Then you wanna completely cover it with oil and then cover the pan with foil, cook it in a 325 degree oven, about 90 minutes. Let it cool to room temperature in the oil. 
It's really important to let it cool in the oil. And then you want to take the pieces out and put them on a drain, put them on a rack over a pan and let them drain for a bit. And of course you can reuse the chicken flavored oil. And in this case, in a bread pan, it only took about two cups of oil. If the meat's cool enough to handle, then you want to debone it. And it'll really be easy to do because it'll be super tender and moist. Cooking it submerged in oil gives no place for the moisture in the meat to go. So all that moisture stays right in the meat. And remember, you've already seasoned it with salt. So the remaining bones and skins get tossed into the stock pot with the roasted carcass and further deepens the flavor of your stock. It's a confit meat in lots of ways. One of my favorite ways is to make a chicken risotto. And I use the oil for making the confit to start the vegetables and the rice in when I'm making the risotto. And then you only add the chicken at the very end because of course it's already cooked. Another way to use the shredded chicken or pulled chicken either done in a coffee or a, a smoked chicken is really nice done this way. Uh, just serve it on some grits or polenta, whatever you want to call it, from wherever you're from. A uh, few roasted vegetables, a little salad, makes a, makes a great little meal. You know, something that seemed to be popular this, this holiday across social media was spatchcocking the turkey. This method splits and flattens out the bird to make it easier to cook. I've never done this with a turkey. But in my class, every semester, we serve barbecued chicken on hoe cakes, and that is how we do the chicken. Most directions will tell you to cut the backbone out, but I prefer to split the chicken through the breastbone. And the way you do this, I'm sorry I don't have a, a video of this, with the breast side down on a cutting board, put a chef's knife through the large opening until it protrudes, protrudes out of the neck opening down on the knife really hard and then if you'll grab the chicken and just roll it over basically pull it up through the knife it'll split the chicken almost evenly then you want to take the carcass and open it up like a book and then press down on it to flatten it out as much as you can at this point you can season it liberally with anything if you just want salt and pepper that's fine it's this picture you see here they were done with salt and pepper because we're going to add barbecue sauce later you could season them really with anything at that point. And one little trick I like to do is once I get everything seasoned and on the pan, I'll actually spray the bird with nonstick cooking spray, which is really just canola oil under pressure. It's a great way to get a light coating of oil on the skin to facilitate that browning without resorting to a brush and making a mess. Just a quick couple of sprays with nonstick spray works like a charm. So. When a chicken is done like this, spatchcocked, depending on the size of the bird, should only take 45 minutes to an hour to cook it perfectly done. Once the bird's cool enough to handle, you just pick the meat off the bones. And of course, you want to start a stock with the bones and the skin and the giblets in the neck if you're lucky enough to get them. With, with. One other note on spatchcocking this way is it preserves the oyster. It's that little bit of, of meat, a little meat nugget where the thigh meets the backbone. If you cut the backbone out to spatchcock a chicken, you're going to lose a lot of meat. You're going to lose those oysters. So once you roast the chicken either whole or spatchcock, spatchcock, this little nugget will pop right off the bone and usually pops right off the bone into my mouth. And the students always get a kick out of that because they get to eat all the oysters while they're picking the birds before anybody else gets to taste it. Roast in a chicken is pretty straightforward. A lot of times I'll take a, when I'm gonna roast a bird, I'll make a rack out of celery, uh, stalks and carrots cut in half and a few onions scattered on the bottom. Just a, a little vegetable rack to keep, it, keep the meat off the bottom. And you see here in this picture, I've done the same thing with some winter squashes, um, peeled and on the bottom with some onion, just to raise it up a bit. Roger's method from the Zuni Cafe is also great. This was a restaurant in San Francisco all the way back to the early 80s, I believe. And she came up with this recipe and I've, I've taught this for years. You need a smaller bird, about three pounds or less, and you wanna salt it really well inside and out. Then you wanna preheat a cast iron skillet to in a 500 degree oven. Yes, all 500, get your skillet hot, 
you take the chicken and put it in the skillet right side up and pop it in the oven. In 15 minutes, you turn the chicken over, close the door. In another 15 minutes, you turn the chicken back over, close the door. And after the last 15 minutes, the third 15 minutes, you take it out and let the chicken rest, take it out of the skillet and let it rest. Just cooking that way and be extra nice and crispy. The magic of this recipe is the juices that are left in the pan. In her, re in her restaurant, she would make croutons in this fat and then serve the bird and the croutons as a salad. I like to sear onions and kale greens in this and serve with the bird. Never waste the pan juices or bones. That's really where all the greatest flavors are. Old school chefs like myself relish getting an old rooster. Um, the only way to make a true French coke au vin or cock with wine. Old roosters are tough and stringy but deeply flavored. This classic starts with marinating the rooster for a day in red wine, and then the bird is browned in a pan, and then vegetables and the red wine marinade are all poured back over it, and it's simmered for several hours. So like I said, these are tough and stringy, but long and slow cooking really brings out the flavor and will eventually tenderize it quite well. There's really no better way to get rid of an old rooster than to do a cocova. Perhaps my favorite way with chicken or duck is on the rotisserie. And I worked in Provence and shopped at the local farmer's market. There was always a chicken rotisserie truck. It was a large gas rotisserie like you see here, capable of mounting a, a few dozen chickens at once. In the drip pan underneath, were always fingerling potatoes and cipollini onions, the little tiny onions that roasted in the drippings. After a morning of shopping at the market, the idea was you would go to the, the chicken rotisserie trailer. They would scoop up some onions and potatoes and put them in the bottom of a foil line bag and then put a whole chicken in on top of that and fold the top and seal it closed. So that way, when you got home, you know, you're tired because you've been at the market all morning. You've been walking around shopping. You get home. Everybody's hungry. Boom. You have ready made lunch. Or as we used to do, just go find the nearest shady tree. It works just as well graduated from using a rotisserie on a gas grill like this. This was a, just a, a simple little gas grill to seriously old school doing it on an open fire. When my grill disintegrated as they all do, what I did is I salvaged the brackets off the grill, put them onto a frame I put together from half inch black iron pipe. You can see there in the picture. Current setup though is, is a fire table. Um, built a structure on this with fire bricks that allows me to cover the top with some old restaurant sheet pans. And that lets it, as it as the rotisserie spins, it also adds a little smoke flavor to it. It's really fun. Friend Richard McAllister that owns Marksbury Farm Processing came up with this idea for this table, which is really just a four by eight frame made of uh, angle, on, angle steel and a steel bottom. And then there's about 150 fire bricks on it. And then you can do whatever you want to on top of it. You can build, you can see on the left there, I've got an open fire for a grill. I've got my rotisserie block. You can build a fire directly on top of it to feed either one of those. It's really, uh, it, it's really been fun having this table. In that picture, you can see the drip pan underneath the bird. And as soon as it starts dripping, then I'm going to put something underneath it. Nice duck on the rotisserie. That's my old version, but you get the picture. And this is one method where brining is really essential. Since you're cooking with a dry heat, a brine bird is the way to go. It seasons the meat internally and hopefully only the water will evaporate during the cooking process and leave you with a really juicy bird. Chicken usually takes a little over an hour on a rotisserie, uh, depending on how hot your fire is. Ducks usually take a couple of hours and I like to baste them very frequently with the pan drippings. Uh, and you can make a brush with fresh herbs. I think an earlier picture sort of had that. My brush there, 
it's just some herbs I grabbed out of the garden and tied together with a piece of twine. And I use that to base the bird. So you're adding flavor. There's a few ways that I really do enjoy duck. And generally, duck should be cooked either really fast or really slow. You know, duck on a rotisserie is a great treat and a great way to spend an afternoon or an evening. But if you break down your duck, then you can cook it in several different ways. You can confit the legs, as I've already described with chicken and turkey. And the breasts can either be sauteed or made into duck prosciutto or duck ham. Really, in the French manner to cook duck breast, what you do is score the skin in a crosshatch pattern and being careful not to cut all the way down through the meat. Start the breast skin side down in a cold skillet over medium low heat. The idea is to render the fat and crisp the skin very slowly. You're really trying to get as much of that fat out as you can. And once you've done this, then turn the heat up to high and turn the breast over and just brown. Uh, the meat side. Keep the meat medium rare to medium at most. So once you get it to that point, you get the other side brown, allow it to rest a few minutes and then slice it and enjoy it. All the duck fat in the pan, that's liquid gold. So to that, I would cook potatoes or onions or greens or all three really. Uh, a neat trick is to have potatoes cut up and parboil them and then just quickly toss them in that duck fat in the pan while it's really hot. It's the best French fries you'll ever eat. Making duck prosciutto or ham is actually very simple. Uh, my chef in France did this pretty much on a weekly basis. What you do is you take the boneless duck breast and bury them in kosher salt, make sure they don't touch each other. So just a shallow pan, layer of salt, lay the breast down, completely bury them in salt and leave them there for 24 hours in the refrigerator. Then you wanna take the breast out, rinse off all the salt, and you're gonna season it with white pepper and then wrap each breast individually in cheesecloth. And if you can hang them in the refrigerator, although most refrigerators don't have wire shelves anymore, like the old ones or like commercial. So if you just put them on a rack on a pan and then turn them over every day and you leave them wrapped in cheesecloth in the refrigerator for a week and at the end, wrap them and slice them thin. And as you can see in this picture, the fat has become translucent. The meat is fully cured or cooked by the salt and it's absolutely delicious. It really goes great on a salad with a mustardy vinaigrette uh, or just eaten as a snack. Also take your, your ducks and braise and boil them. My college, all my college roommates were duck hunters. I was not, but I was a cook. So we got along very well. And every winter we'd make a big batch of duck and dumplings. Still not as good as my grandmother's. <laughs> Braising is a great way to use the leg quarters also. Season them well and then sear them off in a little oil or a little duck fat. And you deglaze the pan with a little bit of red wine. Add some vegetables and cover with some stock that you made from the carcass. Remember, you had to cut the duck up. And just simmer it really slowly until the meat falls off the bone. Then you can, once you, you get it to that point, take the legs out and then just further reduce all the liquid in that pot down to a glaze. And you have a, a great, great duck dish. First learned about guinea hens when I worked as a chef in Provence. They were always available at the local butcher, usually trussed and larded with bacon. And since guineas are pretty lean birds, laying bacon across the breast and trussing them uh, is a great way to prepare them for roasting. If the bird is roasted and cool enough to work with, you can debone it and then cover and refrigerate the meat to keep it moist, get stocked with the bones. We had this in a a very fine French restaurant in Elaine Ducasse's restaurant in the little town I worked in, which I've never forgotten. So the, the guinea hen is roasted, like I said, and then the meat is pulled off, trying to keep it in, as intact as possible. And then you make a really rich stock with all the bones. You got your stock, about an hour is about really all you need for poultry stock, for, except for turkey, poultry stock. Then you strain that stock and then reduce it again by about half to make it really rich, 
And then what you would do is put the boned meat in a casserole and then pour that, that reduced stock over it and then just barely reheat it. Remember, everything's already cooked. So it's also a nice way to have dinner on the table quick if you're having a party or something. Uh, you can do this earlier in the day or even do it the day before and then just reheat it. If you take some vegetables like you see in this and blanch them and put them in with the meat and the stock, So the French term for this would be in cocotte or in a casserole. Uh, you're really doubling the flavor of the meat this way and keeping it delicious. And also just take a guinea hen and just roast it in a pot with a bunch of vegetables, just like you would do a chicken. But with the guinea hen being so lean, you definitely want to roast it in a pot with a lid so you'll keep all that moisture in. I'm gonna talk about quail and work with it cooks really quickly, really easy. My chef in Provence served a salad of quail that utilized every part. So we received the birds with head and feet intact, like you see here, as we did with most poultry. And that guaranteed you were getting what you paid for. Uh, especially with the, all the varieties of poultry they have in France for sale, they always sell them with the head and feet so you can tell if you're getting the real thing or not. Same with the quail. So we'd get these birds, he would make a quick stock with the heads and the feet, uh, just like you'd make any stock with a few vegetables, wine, peppercorns, herbs, etc. cetera. we use in the heads, the feet, and the wing tips, make a quick stock. Then he would take all the giblets and poach in that stock with the, usually a couple of cloves of garlic. And then they were all poached, put them into a food processor and puree them with the garlic and a little bit of olive oil and a little touch of stock if it needed it and make a really quick taste of all the giblets. And he would take that and spread it onto a, a toasted piece of bread, a crouton, and then take that and put on top of the salad greens. Quail was quartered, seasoned, quickly grilled. That on top of the crouton and voila, you have a quail salad. It was absolutely delicious. Uh, and just what I loved about that dish was that he used every single part that came with that bird. You know, the hearts, the gizzards, the livers all went into that little pate that he made just really quickly. What drove me nuts though, is when I came back to the States after working in France, I couldn't make this salad because over here it's illegal to sell a bird with the head. Most, most quail that we buy over here, they're semi boneless. It makes them really easy to cook and to eat. They can simply be marinated or seasoned and grilled. I used to do quail as an appetizer, stuffed and pan roasted. This was a, my Kentucky spin on quail. It, I would make a traditional cornbread dressing or stuffing, but include some smoked pork sack sausage from Broadbent, you know, the sausage that's packed into a burlap tube and smoked. So I would make this, the dressing really, really wet. I would put extra stock in it and keep it wet enough so I could push it through a pastry bag. And then what I would do is I would take that pastry bag and fill up the cavity of the quail just until they plumped out a little bit. Season them well, and then sear them off in a saute pan until they were brown, and then do what's called uh, pan roasted. So you would sear the quail off in a pan on top of the stove, get it nicely colored, then put it right side up in the pan and slide that pan into a hot oven. And it only takes five to seven minutes Cooking. Take the pan out, take the quail out to a plate to rest. And again, the, the drippings left in that pan are where the, all the flavor is. So in that, I would throw in some shallots, some shiitake mushrooms, deglaze that with a little wine, hit that with a little cream, and then pour that over the stuffed quail. It was an absolutely delicious uh, appetizer. I sold a whole lot of quail that way. And, you know, I'm reluctant to tell you this as a chef, but I really don't like liver. I've tried, uh, unless of course you make foie gras or put it into dirty rice. Chicken livers that are barely cooked and then combined with almost an equal amount of butter and then baked in a water bath makes faux or fake foie gras. And a foie gras is goose liver pate. It's a French delicacy. It's very expensive. It's, it's made by a process called gavage, where the geese are force fed, which has been controversial. 
uh, but really shouldn't be. But anyway, you can make faux or fake foie gras with chicken livers. And my favorite recipe comes from a chef, Michelle Richard. Uh, it's available online, lots of different sources. Um, to make this pate, you pour it in the small containers and then seal it either with a layer of gelatin. You can do fun things with gelatin or even as these were just a little bit of extra butter over the top. And again, just like I was talking about earlier with the confit, when you seal something like this in fat, you're sealing out the air so it'll stay fresh. Kind of like granny used to do with paraffin on uh, jams and jellies. Oh, once you bake it, serve it chilled, then you usually eat it on croutons, on toasted bread. And usually with something sweet, either a jam, I really like fig jam, is really great on this, or something like a chutney or a mustarda, but you want something a little bit sweet uh, to go with that liver. You know, another really interesting dish I came across a while back, I was at a conference in Mobile, and we found this little chef-owned restaurant down the street, and he was doing Nashville chicken hearts. So he would take five, you know, the, the hot chicken craze from several years ago that you can still find hot chicken places around here in Lexington. So he would take the chicken hearts and bread them, just like you're gonna fry chicken, bread them, put five of them on a skewer and then fry them together like that, and then brush them with that fiery Nashville hot sauce. I thought it was just a, a great trick for an ingredient that he paid almost nothing for and was very profitable for him and very delicious for us. Uh, that really is a, very, a variation of this, which is the Japanese chicken heart yakitori. So chicken hearts that are skewered and then grilled over hot charcoal and then basted with a little soy sauce, sweetened with a little bit of sugar. Um, down here, uh, I, I love sorghum. I do a sauce like this with this soy sauce, a little bit of mirin, which is the Japanese very sweet wine and a little bit of sorghum, pretty much in equal parts. And you bring that to a boil and reduce it just a little bit, and it makes a great little uh, Asian barbecue sauce for all kinds of things. Another neat dish made out of pieces and parts is uh, Sean Brock, a chef from Husk Restaurant in Charleston. Now he's in Nashville. He came up with this delicious bite that was really almost pure profit for him, fried chicken skins. He was able to get chicken skins in quantity because Americans eat so much cheap, boneless, skinless chicken, they were practically giving him the skins. And all you have to do with, with fried chicken skins is season them, dip them in buttermilk and flour, and then fry them. Serve these with a homemade hot sauce. That was fried chicken, the skin's the best part. So imagine just eating the skin with a little homemade hot sauce. Oh, if you're gonna raise poultry, and hopefully you're going to have eggs, and eggs are a chef's favorite ingredient. Here's Paul Bocuse. It's said that the hundred, the 100 pleats in a chef's old-fashioned hat, or it's called a toque, the chef's toque, are there to represent the numerous ways the chef can cook eggs. Delicious, sheared, scrambled, soft or hard fried, soft or hard scrambled, baked, fried, boiled, poached, deviled or dressed, depending on where you're from, whether you call them deviled eggs or dressed eggs, I'm, I'm in the dead. Made into a quiche. So here's another little fun video that we did a while back about eggs. What am I doing wrong here? Not sure what's supposed to be coming up. Little video. Is it included, embedded in it, or is it a link to? Oh. <laughs> hit, hit play. There you go.
At the beginning of the pandemic, I was interviewed about cooking from your pantry and reminded folks, you know, you can make a taco out of anything and you can always put an egg on it. And that's really true. As far as omelets go, my favorite omelet ever is a roast chicken with white cheddar cheese. That's really putting the chicken back in the egg, so to speak. And it's, it's just a, a great combination I made by accident a long time ago. And for years, I put on a first Friday breakfast here on campus. And I always made the menu match the speaker, which was always, of course, some aspect of sustainable agriculture. I found this in researching this. Here's a picture of one of the first Friday breakfasts, and you can see our own Dr. Tony Pescatore in the background helping me cook eggs one day. But my Sunday treat to myself is sheared eggs, which you saw in that little quick video. So you just take a shallow dish, big enough to hold a couple of eggs, pour a couple of tablespoons of cream over and around them, season with salt and pepper, and top a little Parmesan cheese and really freshly grated Parmesan cheese. The real deal. They're out of the refrigerator. It takes about 10 minutes at 400 degrees. I don't refrigerate my eggs. I get mine from my next door neighbor or my own place. And uh, it usually takes seven minutes. So I can put this together really quick, throw it in the oven for seven minutes, take it out. When it comes out, I push the button down on the toaster. When the toast pops up, the eggs are finished setting and it's a perfect little breakfast. Uh, that's my Sunday morning with the New York Times. Poaching eggs is really easy. Just don't have your water boiling. That's really the only trick. Take a wide pan, bring the water to a boil, then turn it down just until it simmers. Add salt, a splash of white vinegar, and then create a little gentle whirlpool with a spoon, and then just drop your egg. It's really convenient if you take your egg and put it into a small bowl or a cup. It makes it easier to pour into the water that way. What happens the vinegar and the whirlpool both help to keep the egg white together and around the yolk. It only takes about five minutes to poach an egg and it really adds instant protein and sauce to whatever you put it on. So eat really seasonally. I have for years, uh, not only locally, but very seasonally. So when my asparagus is coming in in the spring and those of you that have an asparagus patch, when it comes in, it comes in. And what I like to do is I will, will set up my egg poaching. I'll poach the asparagus first take it out and then poach eggs and put on top of the asparagus a little cheese like you see and some toast. It's a great breakfast or even a great lunch or dinner for that matter. Another way to poach an egg that was in that video is to um, skillet and get it hot with a little bit of fat, take an egg into it, give it a couple of seconds, then add a couple of tablespoons of water and, and put a lid on top of it. It takes about a minute for that water to steam the top of that egg and it very closely resembles a poached egg at that point. So here's a picture of an egg that's been done like that. You can see how the edges are a little crispy. I probably did that in a little bit of butter. Then a little water, pop gets just perfectly cooked. The yolk is still runny and that on a piece of uh, fried bologna on sourdough toast, I believe. My house, a hash is the answer to I'm hungry right now or one of my boys being they want something now. I always try and cook a few extra potatoes whenever I cook potatoes for anything with the idea to make a hash later or maybe even potato salad. I like to think ahead when I cook like that. It's just as easy to roast eight potatoes as it is four if you're making baked potatoes for dinner. But anyway, you know, anything can be made into a hash. So here's one with leftover duck and duck eggs that I made. I had fingling potatoes for something else. I got a little bit of duck I cut up. Makes a really quick hash. And here's another version. I believe this one is mushrooms, onions, and Brussels sprouts with potatoes. And all you do to make a hash like this, it's one pan. Simply reheat whatever leftovers you have. Then make a little hole in the pan. Crack the eggs into it. Season everything with a little salt and pepper. And then just like uh, poach frying the egg, Drop a little bit of water into the pan and put a lid on it. Those eggs will cook in just a minute or two and be perfect, be firm whites and runny yolks. Quiche is for everyone. And some folks watching this will be old enough to remember the, the saying that real men eat quiche 
and I still don't know why that was a thing, but the early 80s one. Uh, classic quiche Lorraine with bacon and cheese, an asparagus quiche, as you saw in the little video that we did, or really a quiche made out of any kind of pre-cooked vegetables. I like to make one. I actually made one last weekend because I had a little extra stuff hanging around. If I have time on the weekend, I'll put one together and then use it for breakfast or lunch throughout the week. Grab a slice, throw it in the microwave really quick, and it's it's great to have on hand. I've given you a bunch of cooking ideas uh, for enjoying poultry in a little different ways, a little bit of a French flair on it, but that's me. I've spent a lot of time in France. So happy to answer any questions at this point. We haven't had any so far, but if you have any questions, oh, somebody has their hand up. Uh, oh, no, put it down. So does anybody have any questions? You can just type it in the chat box. Or if it's a complicated question, I can even let you speak. If you put your hand up. Secret to me. secret to boiled eggs. on what you want to do with them. So it, the way I was taught, the way my mother taught me, and it, and it works very well, is you put the eggs in cold water in a little pot with the lid, bring it to a boil, and as soon as it boils, take it off the heat and leave it on the counter for 10 minutes. And that'll give you a usually a perfectly hard cooked egg. And that's taking eggs out of the refrigerator. Uh, if you're doing something like a ramen bowl, where you want the yolk to be a little bit runny, uh, what you do is bring the water to a boil first, lower the eggs in it, and a ramen egg is perfect at about six minutes. And they'll use six minutes, they actually peel better than hard boiled eggs. Uh, but if you want to do it, the same thing, you can bring your water to a boil, lower your eggs in it, cook them for 10 minutes at a boil, then take them out. Same difference, just upside down. It depends on the size of the egg, too, doesn't it? True. But most people generally get the, the large. The egg. large. Um, what's the name of the restaurant in Nashville for chicken skins? Husk. H U S K. Husk. Husk. On Brock's place and. H uh, U S K? Um, yes. Husk restaurant. Got another one now also that uh, I can't. You Google Sean Brock, he'll, he'll pop up. Um, where in this area can I buy just chicken skins? Question. Uh, I don't know. I ask at the market, if you see at the farmer's market, if you see farmers selling boneless, skinless chicken breasts, and they do occasionally, locals will sell that, just ask them. Thank uh, you. where's our chicken processing now? Jerome at Central Kentucky still processing chicken? Yeah. Uh, and then one out in Western Kentucky and um, the mobile processing. No, the uh, Marksbury closed down poultry. Correct. Yeah, they don't do poultry. But this one out in um, way out Western Kentucky. Misty Lee, I can't remember where it is. Um, yeah, trying to get just chicken skin. I don't think that they, they legally sell it anywhere. You'd have to know a farmer that well sean that. there's there's a huge chicken processor in columbia south carolina and i'm sure that's where sean was getting his from yeah yeah if you can get right to the processor but most of our processors are out in western kentucky oh i guess this is national so it could be to check with your local processor um if you have any in your area um but yeah your farmer's market would probably be the best place what are your favorite spices to elevate flavor of eggs? Really, peppers. So I did a long multi-year research project with a specialty pepper called Uba Tuba. Um, I learned to doing that research how easy it is to make your own paprika. So all when it's peak pepper season. I've got a, a farmer friend and she grows, I don't know how many varieties of peppers. And I'll go out and harvest all kinds of different peppers 
bring them in, put them in a dehydrator, and then grind them into pepper into paprika, and then do different mixes with those. Um, I think some of that peppers and eggs are, are really go well together. Something else that I make that's really kind of cool, we call unicorn dust. A friend of mine in Berea came up with this. So you take jalapenos and smoke them, and then you dry them and grind them. And it makes a smoky jalapeno powder. Really, really good. Spice blend you 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 could buy the throws the the Cajun one or uh, the Paul Prudhomme spices you can get those at most grocery stores. Anything that's got a little bit of a kick because eggs are so silky and and almost bland that you want something to kick with it. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any. I think that you gave us some great ideas for, for cooking. Um, you can always Google some recipes along those lines if you need step-by-step -step instructions, but you gave us some good ideas for different ways of cooking. Um, I never thought of cooking the, the chicken or turkey in fat before, but that's that's an interesting one, so. Um, my turkey like that every every Thanksgiving. The beauty of that at Thanksgiving is you cook the dark meat the day before, and then the, a boned and rolled breast like that only takes about ninety minutes, ninety minutes to two hours, depending on the size, mm -hmm. to roast off in the oven instead of tying your oven up all all day. Yeah, right. Well, thank you very much, Bob. You did a great job. Great thank ideas. You. Thank you guys for joining us. As I said, this is recorded and the recording will be available if you, uh, shortly if you want to um, review some of the things that, that he showed us. Um, and I'm sure that you could always contact him as well if you had any idea, any questions, um, just contact me and I will pass on any questions um, to Chef. Just my well, you, can, you can find me pretty easy, just Google me at UK and yeah. I'm happy to answer any questions. And he's always got some great ideas. So. so thank you guys for joining us today. And thank you, Chef Perry, for, for uh, a very delicious talk. So. Take care, everybody.